Hello everybody, welcome to Rocket Lasso Live, episode 33 of season 3. This is the second to last episode, and next week will be the last episode. Make sure that you tune in, because I will probably be doing some giveaways during the live stream, but you'll only be eligible if you're actually live here in the chat. And you have to continue to be there in the chat for it as well. Anyway, uh, how's it going everybody? Eric is tuning in from uh, MSP Airport, which I think is Minneapolis. Welcome. Hopefully uh, that works. Um, Sid, yeah, it does. Uh, the uh, show does stop, but then it begins again after after a little break. I like that break to distinguish between different seasons and to be able to have it not be this forever thing. Like it's got a certain uh, cadence to it. So we got people on YouTube. We got people on Twitch. Start getting those questions together. As always, start posting those questions so we can start tackling them. Uh, if you are posting something, you can only do links and or if you have a link, ask me on Twitch. Can't be on YouTube. And if it is a link, make sure you, I can see the artist or studio who put it together. And you call it the specific effect. But you can always just type out a question. Typed out questions are very fun in general. We have the first question coming in already from Mick. So let's jump in. Why not? Switch the screen. And Mick is asking, how do you go about creating these exploding grass seed pods? Interesting. All right, open that up. Mute the tab. Uh, hit play, because it's going to play a commercial. I'll pull it over in a second. Skip. Okay, so. Aw, oh, neat. Okay, so. Seems to be some sort of plant. I haven't seen this type in person, but that's neat. Whee! Um, I don't know. Is there really much to this effect? I like the backward forward. Um, exploding weeds. Oh, it's from Smarter Every Day. I like that channel. It's a fairly recent one. I don't think I watched this one. Um, I used to, in the household, we used to have those ferns that if you touch the fern that the leaves would close on it. Not like a Venus flytrap, but just another one. It was fun to uh, mess with. Um... But I'm trying to think of anything particularly fancy here. So to add a little bit of complication to it, let's keep it you know, somewhat simple, though. I will make a cylinder and we'll make a slice out of it. So let's just have there be, um, let's see, 360 minus 45. So we got a 45 degree slice out of it. And uh, I guess it's slightly easier to say 3... 60, we'll do minus 30 degrees and plus 30 degrees. So we got a 60 degree wedge and it's perfectly aligned with the X positive. I want a certain number of segments. So let's get rid of the caps. Let's say that this should be mm, 20 segments tall and a radius of 10 and a height of double that, 400. That seems reasonable ish. Oh, I guess we need the caps in order to see the wedge. So we'll keep caps on. All right. Then we need the opposite of that. So um, this will be the stem. This will be the slice. The slice needs to be the opposite. So this needs to go to negative 30 and positive 30. Will that work? Yes, it will. Okay. So now we see the wedge there. It doesn't need as many segments. The rotational segments. So I can click and drag. So that's approximately similar. Okay, so if we're doing this in the simplest way, we want it to be able to kind of curl away and travel upward, but also have the overall plant be curling a different way. So we can do that with two different bends, and if we build the hierarchy correctly, it shouldn't be too difficult. So creating a new null, I'll grab both pieces there, hold down shift as I move up exactly 200, so it's sitting on the ground. Make them children of that. Now, a direct child of the slice will be fed a bend, so holding a shift automatically made it a child, and I guess that automatically adapted it to be this orientation. I would like it to be on Y minus, actually. And I think Y minus. Let's give it some strength, and you can see it bending. I guess it was supposed to be Y plus. Yes, no? Oh, is that fit the parent again? Oh, that's the alignment for fit the parent. Yeah, there we go. I hit fit the parent again. Okay, so that's bending. Um, what exactly is going on there? Why are we getting this weird pinchy wedge. Maybe 
Mm, that'd be interesting. Maybe there's no slice. Oh, there are not. Look, there's no slices on the interior of that. So that makes uh, all those shapes we made slightly redundant because we need those proper subdivisions traveling through. Not the most difficult thing to compensate for, but let's build those again using a, not circle, we need a, where is it? Arc, nice arc. So the arc has several different modes. Let's set the radius back to the same 20, lay it flat on the ground. And the arc, it should actually be a sector. Nope, not sector, a segment. Yeah, so now if I deselect, you see it's actually this wedge shape again. So we can do the same setup, which will be 30 to 330. Yep, so we get our Pac-Man. And then that gets fed into an extrude. And that extrude will be up on Y. It will be subdivided, I don't know, let's say 100 times. And offset to 500. That's too many subdivisions, let's say 30. Okay, so similar setup, traveling upward just sort of working. The uh, subdivisions here are set to uniform. Let's change that to adaptive and now we don't get those extra points in the uh, straight part of it. We don't need that detail. And we can lower this down if we want to keep it clean, similar to what we had before. Okay, so that's now a new version of the wedge. We'll make a duplicate of that and we do the exact opposite again, which would be minus 30 and positive 30. Should give us the exact same result and it automatically has a correct subdivision. Okay, all that that has done for us has given us the proper subdivision in there. So that should fix that. The uh, this now becomes the slice, and that is the stem. Group, group, move down. Okay, so now that that's happened, now I can drag this bend back in as a child, and now it should bend, and it's going to look correct. You can see how it is arcing nicely. Visually, I shall hide the bend. Oh, apparently, if I have it selected, it highlights it anyway. But you can see that is bending up. If I... Mm, oh, and I want to keep the length, so I always turn on keep length. So it's going to curl upward. Now, what I'd like to do is have this be not necessarily that long if we don't want it to be. So I can shorten it, and now I have the ability of move traveling this up through it. So you can see we can get that peel happening at any given point. If we wanted that to... Mm, is there a way to do that? I think there is. If we say that this should be... Mm, maybe... What I would like is have it keep on curling beyond that. So we'd have to say unlimited, but that will bend it on the top as well. But then we might be able to give it a fall off. The point here being is as I move it up, it's going to keep on curling even further. And especially if we give this like a little bit of a degree bend, then we can get twisting in on itself. When I move it, I'll make sure it's on world axis. So that would curl in on itself if we can get it working properly. But we need that upper part not to be affected. So let's see if we can go to a field and turn on a linear field. And sharpen up that transition. Spin it. Yeah, that's sort of working. But I'm worried that if it gets to the, uh, the particular angle, like if we move this here, once that moves beyond that linear fall off, it might break it. So let's see if it gets, it doesn't get to that point, so that could work. But if I keep on pushing up, I think eventually we'll see it. Eh, it's still kind of working. So yeah, let's just say that that's good. So that curls upward and it gives us the twisting motion. So if we wanted both of those to then be bent, I guess, I'm I was trying to think of my order of operation. Maybe that's not as straightforward as I was thinking it would be. But let's see what happens. Make a bend. I'm going to make a child of both of them. And because this one's a child of the hierarchy, that one will be calculating first, even though it comes later. And if I make it a child of that, I should be able to fit to parent and then pull it back out again. And that should be what is doing the bending. Now you can see I can bend it, but the other one is calculated first. So it's going to get some weird stretchy deformation going. If I wanted it to calculate before, would that even make sense? If we pre-bend it, then the other bend can't pass through. Hmm, I thought that doing it in this order would work, but, and you can see that like logically, like this does work fine where I, you know, it's clean to have that bent and then move this up. It's just that that's getting a little bit deformed. If that's not something we're worried about, it kind of looks like string cheese right now. Um, 
But yeah, if we're not worried about that, then we can totally get this curl going. We could, I wonder if this will break it, but if we increase the strength, you see you get it twisting it on itself. So now that it actually twists in over itself, you can actually get this nice spiral. And we get that spiral because I had tilted it. It's now bent like three degrees. And that's where that comes from. And I can still just animate this going straight up and down. And, you know, working pretty well. I'm trying to think of any way I would go to get around that. Um, if you're doing it with bends. Maybe I don't have a simple way of doing it. Maybe this is good enough. I don't want to spend too long on this and tackle more questions. But, yeah, that's the idea. Hmm. Yeah, that's what I'm going to go with. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Let me save that to episode 33, Scene Files, as always. If you are supporting on Patreon, you can get access to these files. 1A. Mm. Plant stem curl. Good enough. Um... Dean is asking why the top deformer is calculating after the bottom one. It's because it's just the order of operations in it. This is, you can imagine it that the bend is acting on this object. So, I mean, well, literally, this bend is acting on this object, and this bend is also acting on this object. What is this object? Well, in order to get that object, everything that happens below it has to get returned. So... Um, it is acting on the final state of the object below. Now, in theory, we could pull this bend out and have it affect both of them, but then limit it externally. Like if I move that outside and before, it, obviously it's deforming both of them, but we could then potentially limit that to some sort of selection tag so it would affect the other one, and then we could change the order back and forth. But I don't think that that would actually improve our situation at all. So that's why I didn't worry about pursuing it in that direction. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. Let's see. Scrolling. Let's see. Hugh the Chew. Well, a question from Umbrella. What do we got? Oh my goodness. Uh, how do I even interpret this? Is this for me? So, this is from Hugh Messy. And it seems to be a hand drawn. animation of I don't even know I don't know what is it supposed to be any regular flow mesh maybe it's it says stop motion and it this might even be embroidery yeah it says hashtag embroidery so somebody might if it's real somebody might have made a series of animations by like stitching these in to some cloth for real and then just making a loop of some sort um, so really cool. Um, but you know, this is, this is full on character animation. There's hand, you know, presumably as called stop motion, presumably hand animated every frame. So to extract, uh, you know, different elements from here, you know, there's the stylistic thing. There's the stop motion idea of it. And then there's the actual animation of it. And if we were to try and animate this in 3D, this would be like a, a three-day project or something to actually like rig up a character, you know, make a character, rig it up, do the animation, get this entire thing going. And then even look at all this crazy deformation that happens as these blobs are fed in. But, I mean, really impressive. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything to extract from here. If the if Umbrella, if you want to more specifically call out an effect you like. But this is just so intrinsically complicated and... It wasn't made in 3D. I always like those as reference, but it is so very not something that can just be made. There's even a, um, uh, a tricky thing in cinema that you can't rig splines, I don't think. Let me, I want to answer my own question here. If we do something really simple, let's simply, well... I guess that's what I would do. Well, I'm trying to think. No, see, I wouldn't do that. If you, if I make a helix just to make a straight line spline, and I 
get rid of the radiuses, and then we get the straight line, and let's get rid of subdivisions, and then make this exactly 20 points. Um, if we convert this, can we convert character, convert to joints? Nope, you need to make it editable to do it. So, making that editable, I'll copy it and make it editable. Character, convert to joints, and now we... Oh, it still didn't make a joint chain. The helix has 20 subdivisions. If I make it editable, it's got 20 points. So when I say MoGraph, or I'm sorry, character, convert... Oh, I was clicking convert to joints, and that only looks at the hierarchy. I meant to do spline to joints, which I don't think was there until it was made editable anyway. But anyway, now... You know, now we do have this entire joint chain. I can middle mouse button click to select the entire hierarchy and then select that. And if I were to say uh, character bind, then you'll see what do we got here? Well, it did put a skin tag on it and it did put a weight tag. So let's see if that behaves differently than I expected it to. So back into object mode, let's rotate that. And this axis, let me change this to um, filter crisp preset, so it hides all itself. And yeah, actually no, um, it looks like it did deform the spline. I didn't think, I didn't think skin deformers worked on splines, but it seems to have. Yeah, huh, okay, it does work. Um, okay, well that does open up the possibility of rigging up a spline-based character like that. Um, so, you know, just to follow through on that idea, I, I'm just going to make a slightly animatable scribble is my goal right now. If I hit... Well, we don't even need to do that. Let me copy-paste. We did this last week, but I'm going to make a spline. Let's temporarily hide this other stuff. So here's a spline. I want there to just be three controls. So I don't know where the middle point is, so I'll sh select all, shrink, 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 shrink. And you can, it'll be right there in the middle, but just as a trick, you, I could just keep on hitting uh, UK, UK, shrinking down until I see the middle point. But essentially, I want that point, this point, and that point. Invert my selection. Now I have three controls. Um, and then we can rig this joint chain with a simulation. No, uh, rig the joint chain with a rigging. Yeah, I was looking for character, but it's rigging. Mm, this will be an IK spline. So that can be fit to a spline ending on the final joint and then we create the handles one two three create the nulls one two three and now we've got something that can be controlled so that joint chain can now be controlled via these nulls so if i pull this over you see we get those curves by selecting um what's the best way to do that i'm going to zero out i'm going to freeze these transformations freeze all so that i can uh, give these a bit of a handle. I'm not sure how much. I'll say 25 by 25 by 25. So now when I grab this and move it, you should see there's a bit of a curve to it. Yeah, there's a nice curve going there. It's a very easy control for us to do and get nice clean curves. So that is now controlling that joint uh, like overall setup. So now let's go back to our original spline. And do I still have the original one? No, I copied it, so I don't have it. Uh, I thought about using uh, recall, and I didn't think I needed to, and now I wish I did hiding the originals we've got this spline here what i'm thinking is well um what i want is a whole scribble here i'm trying to think of different ways to get a scribble going but we could there's a lot of different ways we could do it i just want a really complicated spine filling up a shape um so that's an obvious thing to use ricochet for but like you could just just to show you if you wanted to skip this and you don't have ricochet which is a plugin that i make uh, you could always go to your sketch spline and start like drawing tons and tons of scribbles, but I want like a lot of them. Um, so I'm going to use ricochet. So creating a basic shape. Why don't I hmm, anything crazy? We make some sort of, no, let's keep it simple. I'll just make a cylinder, go to the side view. I want this to kind of match where our joint setup is right now. So I shall do that. We can overshoot a bit. Go down object mode so we get our handle then we don't need the radius to be nearly as large and then I'd also like a sphere 
let's put there there's almost like a head on the top of kind of a match shape nothing super fancy and shrink that down and then I want to turn this into a blob so volume builder into a volume mesher feed both of those in that should create a geometry singular geometry blob for us and now that I've got that blob this is geometry uh, so under extensions I can create a ricochet and that ricochet I can feed this actually just directly in as a child and now you can see I've got my ricochet plugin and that is bouncing a line around filling up the space so selecting that I should be able to like just increase the number of bounces and you see how really quickly I can get this very randomized shape moving around and we can add like a lot of randomness in here to make that really staticky. I could put in some surface alignment to make that be aligning with the edges a little bit. So that's pretty much what I wanted to do. We got that somewhat crazy shape. We could add more and more, but that should push that far enough. Um, so um, I'm not gonna use any recall right now, but I'll copy and paste that, turn off that entire hierarchy, make this one editable. So now it's returning a spline. I wonder if it has to be made editable, but we'll keep it editable for now. Anyway, I want to move this down. I'm going to select the entire joint hierarchy by middle mouse clicking on it, selecting the ricochet, and then see if indeed we can bind to that joint chain. So if that did work, because I created a weight tag and a skin tag, if I grab this handle and move it, yeah, look at that. That's pretty cool. That is not something, I didn't think we could do that. So uh, that's pretty cool. Now, of course, the subdivisions on the spline are really important. And you see right now it's not very subdivided. So like these are really straight lines. So subdividing that further before we fed it in would probably be a good idea. Um, trying to think of what the best way to do that would be because binding that is so simple. If I go to point mode, you'll see that a lot of these points don't have that many, like those straight lines, obviously are traveling all the way from bottom to top. If I set that to subdivided and let's say that it goes every 10 units, can we current state to object that and will it bake it down? So current state to object, so like this. Yeah, that one now has way more points. You can see that's subdividing every 10 units. So now that has been subdivided. Now, middle mouse click, select that one. Character bind, so that's been bound again. So now if I grab that control, go to object mode. Now when I bend it, you see that's kind of a little bit more properly bending, so. And then, once again, these are based on the curves. So going back inside of this control, if I increase this curve, maybe that must be the bottom one. If I increase this middle one, you can see that the curvature of that center one is going to get rounded out a little bit more and make that cleaner. And now that that has been bound, I'm curious if we are able to change this to something like a B-spline. Ooh, my. Okay, yeah, apparently the binding of that can't handle it. This is dangerous, but I'm going to test it anyway. We do have the upcoming plugin which I'm aiming for late October. I'm not 100% sure. Um, binding splines. I am curious, like I wanna round these out. Clearly we can't change the subdivision type because that's going to mess it up. But I'm going to attempt, this is a test I've never done before so it might break, who knows, it could even crash it. Um, but I'm going to load up the upcoming utility spline and grab a smoothing. And I want to see if I can take the result of that and put it into the smooth. And yeah, seems like I can. You see that it's adding layers of smoothing and the entire thing gets rounded out. So I can super simplify that. Now that it is rounded out, I just want to see if I can still move it. Yeah, that still updates and goes. So that's really cool. Another, that's a good use case for uh, when I make the demo video for, um, for this tool. Um, and then, you know, if you wanted it to have more fidelity, even the smoothing goes a long way. Um, well, it's doing a fine job smoothing, but we can always reinterpret the points as well. Right now, if I turn on these points, you can see that it's showing where every subdivision is. But I could say, you know what? I want that to be have one subdivision every line, and there's twice as many of them. And now there's twice as many. You can get like more fidelity or have not quite as much smoothing. Like just a little smoothing will go a long way for taking the edge off those lines, but maintaining your original shape really well. So. But yeah, that uh, I didn't, I didn't think you could rig splines. That mean if that got added in in some version of Cinema, then that's like a really important. Um, it's like a really important setting. If it got snuck in, I didn't know it. I'm gonna save this again. I don't expect anybody to be able to open that file because it is using utility splines. 
but uh, I just wanted to try opening this in a older version of Cinema and see if it uh, see if they, if that binds. I'm just curious if it got added in or not. Uh, Burnwolf, thank you. Yeah, uh, the smoothing plugin is something upcoming. If you haven't seen the previews, I've talked about the previews. I'm not going to do a full one here, but there's an upcoming plugin that is the utility splines, and it's actually going to be all five of these at the same time. So it's one to like convert things to Bezier, clean up the splines, reduce the splines, resample them, and smooth. Um, okay, close, open. Okay, so I've opened up R23, and let me just try and open the same file. Okay, won't have those splines, but that's fine. Um, it just, but it still looks like it's bound. So it could do. Cinema was able to do this for a long time, and I just didn't realize it. Well, that's cool. I, I mean, I obviously all the tools we're making. You can tell I love splines, and I didn't think you could bind splines themselves. But now that we got this, def, you know, this object that is successfully getting deformed, it does open up cool additional possibilities. And now, it's, now that that's getting smooth, that could be fed into some geometry of some sort. Let's give that a sweep. And feed that a N side set to two. Nice. Yeah, and now you get that uh, entire blob going. So yeah, that's uh, that's pretty neat. And what's cool about by rigging up the spline and not the joints. Or I'm sorry, by rigging up the spline and not the final geometry, each of these tubes is exactly the correct thickness. Because the tubes aren't being deformed, the line that generates the tubes is getting deformed. So that's pretty neat. Um, and yeah, you could totally make some cool, wacky, stringy characters with this. So yeah, shrink that a bit, and you get all the static. And then even if you want to make this look a little bit stop motion-y, like I think that clearly it needed to be made editable to get bound. I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure. But if we were to just deform those points somehow, let me make a, and this has nothing to do with the plugins, if I were to make a random, put the random in after the smooth, so it's taking that result, and I say, I would like you to deform the points. These actually run really quickly. And yeah, that's randomly deforming the points. I can set it to a noise and index it so each one is random, and that should give us the ability to hit play and get some motion from it. And the scale is important, so we could shrink the scale and then the animation speed, you know, put it up something really high, and now you can get your full-on stop motion. And if we just start pulling back on the strength, we can get the overall shape, but like a bunch of static. So it's like you can clearly see the overall, the overall shape, but you know, a stop motion-y look on top of it. And then I guess if you are combining this with smoothing, if I put this before it, then the smoothing comes after that deformation. So you see that we got pure static there, but if I turn on the smoothing, you can see that we've got something that looks maybe more stop motion-y, more static-y, but we can get that level of smoothing on after the fact. And you know, that's only one iteration of smoothing. We probably put several in as we do. You can see you get that nice jitter, that nice jittery look on top of it, um, and everything else is staying live and parametric. So yeah, working shockingly well. I'll just save that file again in case, well, you know, in the future when people can get their hands on utility spawns, maybe that will be useful. But yeah, sorry, that was mostly satisfying my own curiosity, but I feel like I learned something. Um, ba, 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 ba. let's see, people talking back and forth. Yeah, the track modifier would add a nice effect to it. That, you actually, you're probably right. I would think that the track modifier could work on here. I haven't done a lot with a track modifier. And then somebody, when I was talking, when I was doing an initial test and I was talking to some people at Maxon, I thought they had said that you couldn't layer up more than one, but then somebody, I saw on Twitter, somebody did layer up more than one. It's like, wait, I thought it explicitly didn't do that because my very first idea was like a stop motion-y but smoothed out effect. So I would kind of like to see that. Um, so I guess as sort of a follow-up question, we'll, we'll, temp, we'll turn off the smooth. So now we're not seeing any, there's no plugins at all right now. This is all just vanilla cinema as far as a final spline being there. Uh, and in fact, we can even turn off that deformation for a little bit. But let's try the track modifier tab just a little bit by just keyframing a couple of these controls. So I'll just control uh, this top, mid, box. Okay, so we got the top and middle. And I suppose we could put those into a null. And let's just keyframe those. Uh, you can turn on auto keyframe. And where does that hide? They move things around. Settings. Oh, active objects. That's fine. Where is 
Oh. No, that's the tween tool, so that's... Oh, okay, you... Hmm, that's interesting. I would expect that being highlighted would mean don't use it, but highlighting means don't. So that's movement, rotation, scale, parameters. I assume that's scale. Well, anyway, that should be automatically keyframing these for us. So let's initialize the keyframes by saying I want to control the position and rotation of those. And what should happen is if I go a few frames forward and move this, as soon as I move that, we should see that automatically keyframe itself. Yeah, you see the position keyframe itself. And for the most part, I'm just going to move the position, so that's fine. So let's say that that moved there and then moved here. And then I'll go forward a little bit more. This is going to be just a super random jerky animation anyway. So I'll just bend that over more. And we'll have that go... Actually, not change much. That's fine. And another 20 frames. And grab this one. And let's swing it around. And I'll just wiggle that a little bit so it keeps frames. And heck, heck, we'll just go to the end. It's straightforward enough. I'm going to, rewind to the <coughs> rewind to the beginning, hold down Alt, drag my timeline. If you're holding down Alt, it doesn't refresh. So that means I can just grab the top two controls and then hit record manually again. So now it's just going to get back in the same place that it that started. That's the idea there. So turn off auto keyframing, hit play. And now, you know, incredibly simple animation, really linear and kind of uh, boring. And there's no smoothing or anything specifically going on on that track. We could always do that. Uh, when's the last time... Where's the control, actually? Maybe not. There's the mode. Yeah, we could go to animation mode. And how do you control it? I thought we could scale these. Hmm. Maybe not. Maybe not because I'm playing. I thought we could select the handle if we're in animation mode and scale it. But right now, oh, it's on the spline, so maybe it's automatic. Whatever, let's not worry about that. I'm gonna go back to regular model mode. Is that control? Oh, animation is under this dropdown, so good to know. Anyway, track modifier tag. So let's attempt to add a um, animation track modifier. So this is new in 25, and currently it's on spring, but I want it to be on posterize. The, I do not find the controls on this particular tool very intuitive. I'm hoping they change it in the future. So right now, it wants to step a certain number of frames. So let's say I want to step every fifth frame. And, but you see, when I change it to those frames... Oh, turn on hierarchy. That's important. There we go. Now that I turn on hierarchy, you can see that it is only returning every fifth. Now, this only works on keyframes, things that were keyframed. It's actually modifying the keyframes. But now you can see we get an automatic, nice stop motion look on top of that. And then... Um, let's say we did want that to also have a static key look on top of it. If I turn this random on, it's going to be doing that stop motion overall mo movement, but every single frame it's refreshing um, every complete randomness as far as deforming those points around randomly. So if I wanted that to also um, have the stop motion look, I'd probably build this slightly differently, where I'd say this is just pure randomness, not noise based anymore, and then keyframe the seed. And then at the end, change that to, you know, whatever, a nice giant seed. And then keyframe that as well. And if we duplicate, well, if, now you'll see if I hit play, that's going to look staticky still because it's just randomly applying giant numbers. But I think if I copy that track modifier tag over, then yeah, now that is only refreshing every fifth frame. So they, you can actually see that that is properly kind of staticky or uh, stop motion on top of that okay so that's another something or other working if we wanted this entire thing could be in the same hierarchy so i think we could take all of this and just make it a child of that and there we go now we now we only have one tag to worry about so now that that is working let's save it again And let's see if we can add some smoothness on top of that. Well, first of all, I can select this, and we could say that this should only happen like every 15 frames, and now it's going to be very, very staticky. But you can do something more reasonable like every four frames, so you get a little bit of stop motion vibe, but definitely at five, we are definitely feeling it pop, 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 pop. So can we add another track modifier tag? That is my question. So track modifier tag. 
come after the first one. So that calculates first, this calculates second. This is the spring tag. So temporarily, I'm going to select this one and turn it off so it don't work. And now I just want to see the spring in action. So spring tag 100% strength. And let's see what we get. I want not much stiffness. Not much, no drag, no stiffness. Hard to tell. It should be, yeah, that doesn't look like it's super smoothing out, does it? That seems really stuck to the line. Hmm. Yeah, that's not changing as I change these. Am I doing some? Um, maybe I forgot hierarchy again. No, okay, I did forget hierarchy again, but that didn't. Oh, let's get rid of stiffness. There we go. Okay, I forgot. I, I, I got to remember to turn on hierarchy. So hierarchy is turned on. You can definitely see it's doing something now. If we get rid of all that drag, now you can see it's overshooting. Okay, that's what I was looking for. So we add. So now you can see we can get this wiggling. So now what happens if we layer that on top? of the first one. Does that work? Um, yeah, I think it does. So you can layer these up. That that makes this significantly more powerful. I still wish the interface was different, but you can now see, if we make this really stiff, then now you can see that we're getting kind of that stuff. If I make this all the way, it should be pretty much back to the stop motion. You see it's like back to only refreshing every fifth frame. But if we start easing off of this just a little bit, do you see how we start getting like a little bit of in-between going on it? So depending on the amount that we do, we might be able to get like a cool hybrid of the two where it's kind of morphing between states. Let me jump this like 15. So it's like jumps to a spot, jumps to a spot, jumps to a spot. And then over here, I want lots of drag. Yeah, there. So you see how it's now we made that really simple animation. But now you can see that we've got it's jumping from position to position every 15 frames, but it's smoothly jumping between them. So the ability to layer those up is actually where the power of that tag comes in. So that's really cool um, and makes it a lot more interesting. But yeah, I guess I'll save that one again. Okay, but <laughs> I know we've gone way off the rails from what the original question was, but I feel like we got to learn a couple of neat things along the way. Uh, Antonio, what do you got? Uh, oh yeah, and on YouTube, Moss. Um, yep, thanks for coming and hanging out. Hopefully I'm not speaking too quickly. I know I speak very quickly when I'm excited about something and I'm always excited about Cinema 4D. So that means I'm always talking fast. Essentially, if you're hearing me, I'm talking fast. Um, Antonio, first time viewer, is asking, or it's a first time chat, maybe a long time viewer, who knows? How would you tackle something like this? A character being lifted up by a rope around the hips and the arms and legs uh, and body are reacting dynamically. Let's see what we got. Let's see what we got. Oh, it just seems to be a still image, but, you know, I suppose, you know, clean enough. The, it goes, to, uh, for the most part, this goes to, you want a, you, there's two options. One, you keyframe it, then you manually keyframe it, you do the animation. I'm, to tell you, I, you know, I'm a big fan of like hand done keyframe animation. It takes a long time, but it's really fun. Let me see if I can find one of my old animations easily enough. Um, open up a new window and where would I have this? Presumably on this drive. And what would be the word to use? Speedy, old robots, not that one. Oh, old robots, maybe. No, 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 not those. Um, oh, how did I find this? Let's just search for Psy. That seems promising. Open folder location. What's new? Hmm, this might not be keyframed. No, this was me. Restep smooth. Are any of these keyframes? Oh, that, oh, that's before it got retimed. Oh, okay, that's sort of one. 
But yeah, so you know, I'm a big fan of manually animating something. So back when, what version? This was when uh, S24. This was only like six months ago. When S24 came out, I was showing how to use the tween tool. So like over the course of like, I don't know, 15 minutes, like it's, you're able to make this kind of animation, like stepping through auto keyframing and then doing a little bit of work on the F curves. So you just build it manually. And it, you know, once you get used to keyframing a character, if you rig the entire thing up, it's not that difficult. And you get 100% control of everything that's happening. And it's really fun, and I do enjoy it. And it's it's a very of doing three D in general is a very technical process. But for me, the most like artistic process where it's like the software kind of goes away, and then you're just creating. It's like your creativity getting translated directly onto the screen through your skill is keyframing a character, um, especially something kind of cartoony. So. Um, that's a long way of saying that, you know, I like keyframes. I would like to find one of the other ones. Side, oh, sidestep. Um, maybe open file location on that one. Do I have the f cinema file? Because, well, here's an animation I had done. Oops. That's just looping. But I spent like a lot of time on this. You know, th this one actually took a long time because I was really following like the principles of animation, the follow through and overlap. But this is hand keyframed. So every single little movement is something that I, uh, I controlled. What does this one look like? <laughs> so yeah, just, uh, you know, not necessarily amazing things, but the uh, point being having a rig and just having some fun and sitting down and doing some animations can be pretty fun and satisfying. So I don't get a chance to tackle those types of things terribly often. So that is one process that you could do. The other is making a fully dynamic character and there's rigging it up however you want to anywhere. Um, so if we want to do that, we need a ragdoll. And I have a full tutorial on creating a ragdoll, but let me see if I can find a copy of the ragdoll. I used it recently. Well, I know where to find one. I can just search for balloons. I gotta finish that project. Um, balloon. No, not that one. Maybe this one. Must be a big file. Yeah, okay. This does seem to be the file. Okay, so I've already got this character all set up with a ragdoll. Now that I have found a copy of him, let me track down the tutorial so I can link it. So this was uh, ragdoll... Schmidt, not Ragdoll. Rag. Ragdoll Chris Schmidt. Um, Cinema 4D. I should probably get it. Yeah, okay. There's the official. Here it is. Oop, there's an advertisement. Bump, bump, bump. So you would first have to follow this tutorial and make yourself a full on Ragdoll. But over the course of this video, we go through and we turn this figure into a ragdoll, and then I, we use all, all these dynamic controls, and then we, now that it is dynamically controlled, I was able to put different forces in it, and eventually we map it to a character. It's a big, giant, detailed character ragdoll animation tutorial thing. But now that I've got that, well, first of all, here's the character. I've shown this before on the stream, but I'm sure people, some people haven't seen it. If I hit play, these balloons are actually dynamic, and you can see the entire character getting dragged off into the sky. Whee! So, but today, we don't worry, we're not worried about the balloons. We're not worried about much of this, actually. Um, what are those? Those are probably some central attractor. There's overall friction. That's this box, which we don't need. This is what's keeping him upright. There's the character, geometry for the character. Where are the balloons? Oh, down there. Okay, balloons are gone, that's gone. Just simplifying things. Okay, if we have play now, okay, now that the character's just set up in this basic ragdoll state, so you can see he's designed to have certain gravity that's trying to keep him upright, but he is fully 
dynamic. Um, just some fun things. If I think of it, yeah. If I turn off this gravity, then you'll see him just flop onto the ground. So, very fun. I definitely, definitely recommend that tutorial. You get to build this whole thing pretty much from scratch. Um, so, once you have that ragdoll, then we can just do whatever we want with this thing. So, um, we can hide the geometry and just look at the ragdoll. So here's actually the ragdoll. And I actually modified that geometry to match the proportions of this character as well as possible. So he's gonna look a little bit lumpy here, but it is a SWAT guy. But now that that's happening, we can just do dynamic things. So um, the best thing would be some sort of joint chain. But what let's do, do the super simple, and we should be able to do it in real time. Here's as simple as it can possibly get. Moving this cube to the back of the character. I'm going to place it kind of right around the small of his back and make it a rigging, not a uh, simulation, collider body. So it's dynamic, but it doesn't fall. It's, it's something that we control. And then we need to make a connector. So simulation, dynamics, connector. Well, that becomes a child of it. And actually, no, let's not do a connector. Let's do a spring. That works. might work even better. Might be a little finicky, but let's see if we can get working. Dynamics, spring. And that spring, I'll make a child. Um, reset, transform. And I want that spring to link from the cube to... I'm just going to pick his body. There, I picked it. And now you can see it's linking. Uh, it's not. Oh, it's linking to the center of mass. I want it to link to offset, which should be... Zero, zero, zero of that object. So now that that's happened with any lock, if I hit play, oh, hey, the spring has a certain length that wants to keep, but that's fine. And I want this to always draw, display always. Okay, so we got that spring. So with any lock, I should be able to just pull this up into the air. And, well, now it looks like he hung himself, but it should be, yeah, it's just depending on how heavy the different parts are. But now you can see that because he's a full ragdoll, I can just connect this anywhere on his body and have him flop around controlled via that and any connections we make wherever that is that would just work um switching this around um let's rewind that let's say that the i'll have to say spring you are not linked to the upper body let's just say that that is now linked to his foot so now we hit play now it's going to yank him up by his foot and wherever his foot's connected is what is dynamically linked so once you do that ground level work Boing, boing, then you are kind of free to uh, do whatever you want. And the fact that this runs this quickly, I think I could even get this running in real time with like up to 12 characters, as long as it's just kind of like this preview. So yeah, um, the entire thing set up. Very fun. Um, I don't think we have to do much to duplicate. If I just copy and paste, there should be two of them now. I'll just grab both blocks to control them. They play and now there's two completely independent ones and you see it's still running quite well bonk we yeah a lot of fun to be had the uh do i have one in here i don't have it directly in here but while we've got these guys just hanging around it's always fun to grab one of the dynamic forces which is like all dynamics are doing something and if i start increasing i don't know if the, if the range is fine but let's start increasing this by orders of magnitude let's do it from the beginning as well um this should make start making so that he the, all of the different dynamic parts are self-attracting. So as I increase this number, I'm not sure how large we need to get. I'm not seeing much of an effect, honestly. Oh, actually, there might not be much of an effect because all of his dynamic parts are probably excluding things. So if I go to forces, yeah, it's only including certain things. So I'd have to manually add the force into all of them, which is not going to work so well for us here. I'd have to manually add it to all of them. Um, Unfortunately, because I was going to make him compress into like this ball. But, uh, but anyway, we ignore that. Boing. So yeah, anyway, ragdolls. Very fun. So those are the two methods. Unfortunately, unfortunately, both methods require a time investment. So, um, but yeah, that should do it. So this is still based on the tutorial. Those tutorial files are available, but I don't want to... This file I'm not going to put in the collection for today. Um, but yeah, hopefully that answers the question. Hopefully. Um, okay, we should have the model open at all times. So, yeah, that's true, Dean. Like, that that should just be... Every time anybody asks a question, it's like, okay, let's throw the ragdoll guy. Um, 
let's see. Okay, it seems like that's giving Antonio some directions to look at. Um, okay, let's see. Dinosaur, thanks for hanging out. Um, let's see. Seeing people play with Ragnall always feels like watching a voodoo sorcerer. Yeah, they're just fun to tinker around with. Uh, oh, yeah, I saw that there's a question that people really were digging. So thanks for, as always, if you see a question you like, you can go ahead and second it or third it, or in this case, case fourth it. So let's see what we got here. Mute. Okay, super crazy looking. Uh, Mazikina? Mazikina? Let's see what we got. A lot of cool mography looking things, but specifically we've got this one going, which is looking really cool. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, this it's giving you the vibe of um like those stress balls you can squeeze that have like the netting on them. Now, uh a couple details we need to know. Couple details. One is are these static? They definitely are kind of moving around, but they're not moving around in a fully dynamic way. So I think that they are kind of static. Uh, and then this might be one that we should jump right into Redshift to maybe make it look pretty. So let's see what we can do. I don't know. We're just playing around here. So opening up a brand new file. Let's get ourselves a baseline to work from. Um, let's make it extra gross and make a figure. I need this to be one blob, so put into a builder, into a mesher. And then what I like to do here is we'll need to increase the poly count, but then it always looks a little bit thin and wispy. So then inside here, I will create a dilate and a road, which is you can treat like an inflate. And by just inflating it by one or two, you can actually just thicken that up overall. So now we got this nice even mesh overall. Then we can start doing something to, let's put it into a pose. Or no, I guess we can't do the ragdoll because then it wouldn't, uh, it would be jumping all over the place. And we want to make this a little bit uh, more stable, even though this is a perfect, if it wasn't, if, if I didn't have a very specific thing I wanted to do, this would be a really great example of the ragdoll. But let's just put into a, at least a bit of a pose. Doesn't have to be much. Let's just bend that and then grab. Actually, this would be a lot easier if I just select the head and then the body can bend over a bit. And let's have that go back and we'll have, let's say he's just floating in space. So his leg can be bent, bent, We. Something like that. Just getting a couple bends in there go a long way. I want it to look a little bit more like he's floating. <laughs> there you go. That's a goofy enough pose. And then if he's supposed to be floating, then maybe the entire thing should uh, spin to an angle. Whee! Good enough. Okay. So just a little extra something. Uh, might as well zero out the entire character as well, being a little bit more in the world origin. And let's get rid of all the grid stuff. So preset Chris, and I turn off the grid and the lines and everything just so it's nice and clean and simple. Let's save it immediately because this one's going to be a slightly more complicated one. Three. And inflating blob. I don't know, inflating blobs. That's fine. Simple enough. Okay, so re-blobify him. So now that's kind of where he's statically at. So my thought is we want to deform the character randomly as a basic starting thing. So actually, how do I want to do this? Can we, I guess we could just do it as a simple noise. So let's try that. Um, MoGraph and plane. So I want a plane effector. It's going to go into the mesher, so it's a child of the mesh, and it's going to deform the po oh, the points. So the entire thing's going to go pretty crazy there. I want it to deform not on Y, but on Z. We'll say out 20, and the entire character's going to super inflate right now. And then under fields, I want to randomize it. So we'll say a random field, and then you see he gets all kind of weird and blobby. Let's make a slightly more interesting noise. So let's do a... Mm, can't go wrong with Naki. 
And we gotta mess with the contrast a bit. Does that get cropped out? That's fine. Um, we got the overall scale. Definitely bigger. Yeah, that's nice. And then give it some animation speed. Let's see what we're dealing with here. Okay. Not bad. But we don't want it happening everywhere all the time. So I shall create a curve. And that will enable us to remap it. So that will go there. Let's smoothly transition in. And when it doesn't inflate, let's let it get a little bit bigger. Not too far. So yeah, now you can see we got different parts of the body randomly inflating and deforming. Potentially we can make it go skinnier. Like we do have the option to do that. I don't think I'm inclined to, but you could. Uh, we also can put a decay here and that's going to smooth it all out. Oop, not a decay, sorry. Decays are good, but I want a delay. And now you can see that's like super chilling it out overall. And if we do something like spring, that should, well, first of all, let's give ourselves way more frames, 9999. Um, the spring is really strong right now, as you can see, it's not doing too much of an effect. But if we lower that down, it's just going to calm it down so the transitions happen a little bit more smoothly. Um, so yeah, that's just kind of a baseline for us. So now we got that deformation. We can always tell this to be deforming further because it's a little subtle right now, and I don't think we want to be subtle on this. So we'll make that larger. Um, yeah, nice. So now we've got that going on. Let us save and clone. So we're cloning. And um, I guess we'll keep it a sphere. I mean, like I've seen this uh, this general effect on a lot of different things. So uh, it can clone onto an object. The object will be the volume measure. The spheres are, we're gonna want them to be pretty tiny. Let's set it down to five for now. That's actually still pretty large. We'll set it to two. We're not gonna go insane with these, but let's have it clone onto the surface. Um, Oh, the plane effector got a Maybe because I had the plane effector selected when I created the cloner, it's automatically applying it. I don't want that applied. It should just be directly on the surface. And now we can say clone as many of these as we want. So let's just keep cranking it up and go blah, blah, blah. So I don't know how far we can go until it's going to start slowing down. So we'll keep it semi reasonable. Change this to a mode that gives us triangles. And just for speed purposes, let's lower the count a bit. And now, save it again. I would like to see how quickly this is running. Still pretty smooth. Um, and we get all these little blobs. We'll probably want more, but for now, let's say that's where we're, where we're going. And yeah, so these different uh, ones are doing a really good job of sticking on the surface. You can see them stuck on it as it moves. So that kind of gives us this baseline where they're sort of under... Um, they're stuck on the surface, but you can see them moving out. Now, the question is, can we have that same random field feed into those, or should we do it as a vertex map? Uh, I don't want to do it as a vertex map if we don't have to, but what I would like to do is be able to feed this random field into different things, which actually we can just automatically do. Maybe, I'm probably gonna regret this, but let's just move in to adding a new plane effector, and that is being fed into there. I don't want to affect the position, but I would love for it to affect the scale in a uniform, absolute way, where these all get 10 times their size. That's way too much. They all get four times their size, two times their size. Um, that might work. Okay, so assuming that is working, I want to limit this scale, not to everywhere, which is right now it's everywhere. I want to limit it to where the random field is. So we fed in literally the same random field. And now what we wanna see is, do they get bigger as this sort of inflates out. They seem to, but I need to exaggerate this. So let's set the radius down to one. So they're way smaller. And then I want to make it really obvious that they're getting bigger by setting up to five. So now, yeah, they get bigger because it's referencing the same random noise. It might not absolute 100% work, but it seems to be working pretty well. Now, something that's unintentional, kind of visually cool, but you can see as these push out, we're getting these random colors applied, which is neat. Um, I think, yeah, right now the colors are coming in as the field and the field is random. Uh, I th think, you know, it's still gonna be random colors. If I say color remap, I want to feed it a gradient, but I don't think that's going to base it on them inflating or not. Uh, there should be a way of, if they move away, they get a different color and we do need that to happen. And that is, this is how much strength is being applied. 
Uh, Demi's asking, can we use Espresso to drive the color of the spheres relative to their size? Um, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping we just do it via MoGraph. Once again, a vertex map might have helped us here. Um, is there any way of knowing that they've moved away from their surface? Sort of. That would be a long calculation, though. Um, I can think of ways of doing it. Let's see. I'm going to say that this is in no way affecting the color. So this isn't about color. This is just the scale of them getting larger. So, and we'll even hit save on there. Now, this one is plain dot scale. Now, let's make a brand new one. Another plane. And this one will be the color. Dot color. So this cloner is also going to be fed the color. This is not going to affect the sorry uh plane color do not affect the position but yes colorize it based on a field so trying to keep this parametric and trying not to make it editable to make a vertex map even though we might be able to make a fake vertex map and put it on i, I still don't trust that method what i'm going to attempt to do and hopefully this isn't too slow is drag in the vol the actual volume measure the mesh of the character directly onto it and that, sh is it going to be referencing the original one? It's probably going to reference the inflated one, maybe. Actually, visually right now, it almost seems to be working already. So currently, it is looking at the points of the surface. Because we have a pretty even point count around, I feel like that probably will automatically work. And here's the hope. As I decrease this radius, these will become lighter. So as I decrease, those become lighter. So you can see as this moves away from the surface, from their original position, they're becoming lighter. And that's just because all of these are referencing how far from any given point on the surface they are. So now you can see we are getting the color automatically through these controls and it's still running at a reasonable speed. So I'm completely fine with that. Um, so yeah, those are now inflating and they're taking on these colors and it just seems to be working pretty well. Now, can we, what can we do here? Several things I'd like to do, but who knows if it'll work. He starts out really inflated. That's interesting. Yeah, why is he so inflated in the first frame? Because he clearly isn't once it goes past the first frame. And we've got the proper order of operations going here. Yeah, why is there that jump on the first frame? Hmm, I don't know. I'm going to ignore it, but I don't know why that's happening. Um, okay. Now, what would be really cool here... Hmm, it's going to be tricky, but let's see what we can do. I'd love to make this dynamic so those are not even overlapping with each other. We could do a push apart. Push aparts are really twitchy. So let's not do a push apart. Let us instead say that this cloner, mm, the overall cloner, yeah, let's do the overall cloner right now. Simulation rigid body. And if we carefully hit one frame forward, we should see all these explode outward and fall down because of gravity. Then let's not do that. Let's say that these are, the shape is based on a sphere and there's no world gravity. Control D, dynamics, Gravity, zero. Now, they'll just, these will still fly away based on the original thing and they'll never slow down. They'll just keep drifting forever. But I want them to follow their original position. So let's give it a five. A five is a reasonable amount. And say go. And now they're staying near the original thing, but you see they're not overlapping anymore. As they get pushed away, they, um, Okay, a couple things. First of all, that's working really well. It's still running at a pretty reasonable frame rate, all things considered. It's also filling up the overall character a lot more. So that's cool. Um, now, currently, in no way is this seeing the surface of the character. It's not interacting with the character. So as these kind of burst away, it's just because they're being told to scale up. And scaling up means that they get pushed away from each other. So I, it's working even better than I thought it would, given the condition we have. I'm a little bit worried that once we, if we make this surface dynamic, it's not going to like it too much. And before we even do that, first of all, I'm going to say all these spheres that are cloning onto the surface, I want to push them away a little bit. So on Z, I'm going to say, hey, push a little bit away from the surface. So you see that they're all away from it. Now we don't need to go too far. Just a little bit will go a long way. 
We might need to remap the color if they're pushed that extra bit away. But now they sh none of them should be intersecting with the surface, meaning we should be able to add a collider body tag. And that will have to be a static mesh, which it automatically set it to. And I expect a significant drop in frame rate. It's still running somewhat reasonably well. And now they're not sneaking through that mesh. So all things considered, not bad. Now, because they are not in the center of that surface anymore, you can see that they're not getting to that dark red very often. So what we'd want to do is inside of our plain color, remap this a bit. And also our remapping here is super important because um, yeah, we want to go to our remap color and we can remap this via a gradient. And now we can say exactly what these are. And let's see, let's go with, and let's make them crazy pink as they go. But you can see they're crazy pink, but I'm gonna say that they're mostly, well, let's go black to pink, why not? But let's start scooting up the black so that they're a little bit more accepting. They don't turn you know, pink until they get really to the edge. And then let's even add a like really light color. We're gonna get even brighter as they go on that edge. So there we go. So that should be colorizing them. They're not in the surface and they're all going and blobbing out, scaling up, doing their thing. Um, and yeah, they're not allowed to escape the surface or they're, they're staying near their original position, but they are getting forced away. Now, if you really wanted to push the, this effect in a big way, um, you'd want there to be like 10 times as many of these, like really tiny, way more of them, so many that they're like piled up on top of each other. And that way you wouldn't be getting these gaps once they scale up. Clearly, you can already see that our frame rate isn't amazing at this point because we've got so much going on. Um, you know, that's not a problem if you're going to send it out to like the uh, viewport. But you can see that there, you know, that there's a bit of a limitation of that right here. Um, let me think. Now, overall, this is inflating a lot. We could grab this random and try actually the plane and we've got our curve here and we could make it less likely for them to go so now there's fewer areas that are going to push out at any given moment so yeah now now those become a little bit more rare which i think we want there's way too much pink happening all over the place so now it's only happening sometimes in some places so yeah now now it kind of stands out as like a little event as it happens um now as far as this being, if we were to set this up to do some sort of render, um, save it. I'm going to hit, just hit save again. We haven't done anything to break it. In fact, all things considered, it's still a very clean setup. Um, there is a level where, in the reference, it looks like these blobs aren't necessarily dynamic. You see if they're just freely passing through each other. Which, you know, it's something we should keep in mind. Let's see what happens if we do just, I'm going to temporarily turn off. Let's rewind all the way. Always make changes at zero. And temporarily turn off the dynamics. And now these are just stuck on the surface. And, you know, it's running a lot quicker now. You see that they're there. They're a little twitchy as they wiggle around. There might be ways of chilling them out. Maybe. Um, but, yeah, we, you know, we might be able to run more. And you can see they don't eat up as much space. And they run a little bit quicker and now they are allowed to pass through each other so if we're going to emulate the effect i think that's something we would need to do let's try adding a couple more segments yeah just to make those more round and then the scale we could also remap that because the scale is currently based on the same thing pushing them out what i'd like to do is make these smaller still so we'll do a radius of 0.5 so way tinier and if they're smaller they don't need to be pushed out as much so we'll just push them out 1.5 Blurp. <laughs> and now the scale can scale them up more. So let's have that do 15. Might be too much, but mm, it seems to be, yeah, it, that's not surprising. It's getting affected early on. So this probably could use a remapping itself. So let's put another curve. And if we start pulling this in, you can see we'll be able to make those smaller in general and then decide when they get larger. And I think something that might be nice is we're going to ramp that a lot. So they don't get very large until they hit something extreme and then they'll get really big. Like they'll suddenly get really big at the end. So now that we do have, it's not dynamic, we should be able to put more of them here. I'm going to try 4,000 ish, which is going to fill it up a lot more. It's going to slow us down more, but you see that it does fill it out more. And actually they, they are even smaller than I thought they were. So and actually, if they're not dynamic, I don't mind them being in the surface. So let's uh, just reset that, right-click, 
on one of the handles. Now they're directly halfway in the surface again. And yeah, now they're doing the thing. You, now clearly you can see that we how many we'd need to make to fill up the overall space. Keep in mind something we might be, we could do is say, hey, don't clone on the surface randomly. Clone in the center of every polygon. And now we're gonna get exactly one per polygon, which might give us some nice even distribution. Something else, if you want to fill that up even more, I mean, you can do vertexes. So now they're kind of on those corners, but you can also say on edges and it's on the center of each edge, which actually will create significantly more. You see, it really fills that up a lot. And those look pretty cool. And you know, it's filling up the surface a lot. You can really feel how those are eating up the space. And you almost get this instant honeycomb type pattern when you use a edge mode, because now every polygon has one on every side. So you do kind of get this nice alternating look. And I feel like that's doing a reasonably good job of showing the overall effect. Um, we could push this out further. Let's deform it out more. So that should, yeah, that's gonna push them out even more. We could grab the scale and tell those to scale out even more to fill up. And yeah, now you can see you know the effect happening a little bit more. And we have a lot of controls that we could individually tell them to behave slightly differently. Um, each of those is moving out their nice little bit. We could add a little bit of random motion. Um, like the scale, they're pushing out like that, but we could say, okay, they do get bigger, but let's also tell them maybe to move out a bit. And we could give them give them some random wiggles, but let's turn on a little bit of position. Now you see they're super flying out, but let's just do it a little, actually that's on Y, let's do it on Z. So now you see they're pushing out more and I can keep on increasing that and they're gonna push out more and more and more. And that's even away from the surface, but you can see that's really kind of inflating those areas. Um, so that might get extreme, but yeah, now you can, yeah, there's definitely like an effect happening there. It kind of looks like corn now, but yeah, that's looking pretty cool and it's doing a pretty good job of coverage overall. And considering the frame rate, or it's still a pretty good frame rate considering how many copies we made. I am curious if we turn this on to save right now. If we do turn this on to a multi instance, will it break anything? Because they're not, when they're dynamic, I didn't think they'd work. But if we make them to a multi instance, yeah, there we go. Uh, everything we've done, we kept this very simple. So now that dramatically just increased our frame rate. Look at how quick this is running, all things considered, on uh, on this surface. So pretty good. Blah, 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 blah. Um, so yeah, uh, for the most part, I think that's kind of the meat of what's happening in the animation that we were referencing. Um, I feel like maybe they're getting a... Well, you know, I could play and tweak and tweak and tweak this forever. Um, I don't think they have the scale quite as large as they are. I kind of like them moving away, like that little bit of uh, expanding away from the surface goes a long way for adding to the effect. Yep, that's cool. And then, let's see. The... Uh, I guess uh, looking at the uh, reference here, like they clearly are dynamic. You see how they're getting pushed away from where they were. But I'm curious, maybe maybe they're dynamic, but then they're inflation. Mm, that's what I'm confused by because they definitely overlap each other. They're free to overlap on top of each other, but clearly they're kind of scooting around the surface. I, I, I we don't have to tackle that as a thing, um, but it is interesting. Uh, I'm trying to think of if if and where I want to go with this. Um, is there anything to do that I really want to explore? I mean, we could go into Redshift, but it'd just be kind of adding a glow on top of everything, which, you know, I know people like adding glows and whatnot. Burp. And even here, I wonder if you... Oops, uh, hide the original figure. Now you're just left with these blobs. Yeah, works pretty well as well. There could be randomness on top of those. That could be nice to get some certain ones more dominant than the others. Inside of the scale in the fields, currently it's just that overall animated random one with a curve. We could feed that another random field and that could be treated as maybe a multiplier. And it could be an overlay, but that's dangerous. But I'll do it anyway. So if some will get larger, some will get smaller. That is just a Perlin noise getting applied to it. But we could say that's just random. So now they're randomly getting assigned a scale. So some will be way smaller, one, some will be way larger. But that just adds a lot of base variation on top of it, which could look cool. Yeah, already I kind of... Yeah, I like that a lot more already. That randomness is... Uh, making different parts stand out more or less. And it's actually kind of impressive. Like there's no dynamics here, but there is almost like a dynamic vibe to it. 
Um, blah, 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 blah. The um, inflation. Hmm. Let's see. Our right, Demi's got a bunch of questions here on YouTube in the video. The spheres are inflated and colorized as a cluster. I think we already got that working pretty well. Uh, and you mentioned the push apart, but like I said, I don't like the push apart. The push apart's really twitchy. Um, yeah, you can use render. If we're in vanilla cinema, we can turn on render perfect and they would render perfectly fine. I just want to see it in the viewport. Um, and then. Pivot and stick. Yeah, oh, I'm intentionally making the push away from the surface. Everything that's happening on this right now is intentional for me. Um, I'm just seeing if anybody. Um, okay, no, I'm just seeing if anybody had any um, questions that added to this. Um, Dean is asking if the blue noise could give us a circle packing effect on here. And yes, it could. We're not very well set up to do that. And I will say that there's almost not a reason to because we're almost getting a circle packing-esque effect automatically because the base mesh that we're feeding in is already very even in its polygon size. So it's already giving us pretty good approximation of all of these separating from each other. So like while a blue noise might do some nice distribution, I imagine it would be slower and then bringing this into the world of nodes would eat up a lot of time. And I don't know if I'm fully prepared to dive into nodes in that way. Um, so yeah, there's definitely ways we could continue exploring this. Obviously there's a lot going on. And if I could think of like one more element to make it do something, I'd, I'd almost be inclined to bring this into Redshift. I mean, the one thing I am kind of curious about that's working really nicely in the reference is the um, these individual bubbles are really giving a, uh, like a stretched out effect. And I'm not even sure how I would go about doing that. The, uh, like, obviously, you make them glow, but there's like that Fresnel effect going on. And is that just from some sort of subsurface scattering? But it would take a while to do the exploration on that. Um, let's see. Mick is asking on the grass curl that we did, the first thing we tackled today, how would you jettison seeds from the blades as it curls? Um,. I don't know if I'm really feeling going back into that. Let me see what else we got question-wise. Um, is there a way to control animation offset in a Redshift proxy? I effectively don't have any knowledge of Redshift proxies. I've never needed to use them. I know that they're really powerful, but I've never specifically used them. So, yeah, I'm not... Uh, I, I can't specifically add to it without, like, more exploration, which I don't think would be a good use of our time. Um, <laughs> Crossfader saying make it grow hairs as it scales up. That would be extra gross, but I don't have any. Uh, we could put hairs on the surface. Hair making hairs grow is surprisingly challenging. Like hair can be a little bit picky on that type of thing. Um, well, that's an interesting idea. Uh, Jr. is asking if. It'd be possible to morph the bubbles into a different shape once they reach their threshold. Hmm, I like it. That's a good idea. Everyone, it might run way slower, and we might not be able to do the multi instance. I need to remember that the multi instance might break it. So later, when it's like, why isn't this working? Maybe it's because of the multi instance, but I like that idea. Let's see if we can do something along those lines. We'll do the simplest possible one, which is just morphing a cube into a sphere, but I like it. Uh, save. And copy the sphere. Actually, do we want to copy the sphere? Well, yeah, I will. I open the new file, paste it, and now we just have this tiny sphere. That's essentially what we want to reference. So this is going to go down to one by one by one, and we get this cube. Subdividing the cube into a, I don't know, not too much. We want it to be low poly. So three by three by three, hitting NB. You can see the subdivision. So that is our cube. I'll actually even shrink it a little bit more. So it's kind of like this equal volume to the sphere. So that is a cube. Make it editable make a duplicate and then get rid of that sphere. Now hide one of them, create a spherify. It's possible we could just do it with blends, but blends are really slow. 
Uh, I'm going to put a Spearify in there. I'm going to say that the radius should be 1, 100%. And now you can see I've converted that cube into a Spear-esque shape. Current state to object to bake it down. And now uh, it's probably safe to do it based on 1, but let's just call this the master. That is going to get a morph tag. So we want rigging. Pose morph. Pose morph based on points. The base pose. This is the base pose. And this one is going to reference. Can we do it? I just want it to snap to it. But uh, let's delete that and then drag in this one and say yes. So now you see that's. Yeah, now we're morphing between the two. How did it get so big? I don't want it so big. T for scale. Smaller, please. Okay. Does that work? Yep, 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 yep. Yeah, cool. Um, maybe just a little bigger. But that is now rel that's a relative thing. Um, we might need to copy that in as a reference, but that's fine. <sighs> reference. Okay, so. Copy. Back into the inflating blobs. Paste. Here's the master one. Drop it in instead of the sphere. Cool. Now we need a morph deformer, right? Yeah. A morph deformer, and well, that's interesting. They all jump to cubes. Does that make sense? Maybe. Does this not need to be a child? Um, inside of the fields, we can feed it. I want to just make sure it's working, so I'm going to turn a linear field. Z plus. And... I would would have thought that needs to be a child. Hmm, okay, interesting. Um, is a linear field linear fielding? Oh, that should probably be external. Maybe. That doesn't seem quite right to me. Yeah, what am I missing? Or do we just put two and blend? I don't want to do that. What am I missing here? I know we always mess it up. Uh, I will turn that off of multi instance just to confirm that it's going to run way slower, but. Did that. Uh work or not? I can't tell if it's refreshing. Yeah, it's definitely working to refresh. I mean, we did feed it. Oh, okay. Well, look, as soon as I put it in, it suddenly worked. So, like I said, we have to be careful there. But it, uh, how slow is it? I'm going to change this to, I don't know, 55, and let's just see how long it takes to refresh. I'm imagining it's going to be quite a while. Yeah, you can see how slow that goes to morph it, but it is morphing. So, i uh, got to wait for that to center itself, maybe. Or did it refresh? No, it's still it's still thinking. It'll come out of it, but it's now asking a lot. Okay. Um, it's no longer based on the edge. It's going to be based on the surface. Probably should turn it off. It's going to keep super calculating every time. Mm-hmm. <sighs> Uh, PR5K, you're saying a simple, you know, you're asking if it would be possible to do a simple expresso rig to iterate through each clone and affect each clone individually. That's asking a lot of expresso. Um, and this is already a fairly complex setup, so I am not feeling terribly inclined to do that or to even attempt to pursue it. I don't know that gives us much that we're not getting. And you can already see that the morph is having to reference this thing externally and it's now super it's taking a long time to do these calculations already 
Um, actually, even that. It's based on the surface, but now... Oh, I moved that over. <laughs> oh, man, yeah. Maybe we won't pursue this too much more because you can see that how slow that is to like even move through. So we're not going to be able to hit play on this. And I'm only got 444 now, where before we probably had like 6,000, 8,000. Um, so, yeah, we are now asking a lot of this. And Espresso would not speed that up if it would even work at all. Um... Just as a final bit on that, we could delete that linear field. And under the morph, go to fields and probably feed in that same random or the distance from the surface, which we did in the color. Yeah, which was working pretty well. So I'm going to copy that and go into our morph and paste it in. And now, in theory, the pinker it is, Okay, yeah, the pinker it is, perhaps the more square it is. Seems to be. Those are quite square. Uh, and then the smaller it is, the more spherical it'll be. We might need to change the remapping on that with a curve. But, yeah, it is doing it. But I don't even want to increase the amount because that's just going to make it go way slower. Uh, I would like to move on to a different question, though. So does anybody have a new question? Um... Yeah, at uh, Lignatio, as I mentioned, I, we could do it with a blend. I was thinking that a blend would be a way to do it as well, but I thought that would be even slower. I guess we can do a quick test to see if it is not slower, but I am not hopeful. But I wasn't even going to save that one because it was so slow. But if we delete that, well, how slow is this? And now we're not, there's a morph tag, but well, let's just find out. I'm going to make a duplicate of this one. I'll say that the strength will be zero, so... Yeah, half of these should be spheres, half of these should be cubes, right? Should be, but they all look like cubes to me. That's weird. That's super weird. Hmm. Okay, well, now now half of them are half of Mark. Changing the cloner to iterate from iterate to blend. That should be blending them. It's going to blend them from start to finish. So we should get a full spectrum randomly. But then if we say we need a new effector doing something, so I shall say plane effector, this plane effector will not be affecting the position, but it will be affecting the weight transform. It might be affecting the modify clone. Yeah, it's modify clone. I want this to 100% affect the weight modify and it's not going to look like much yet. Oh, let's also say don't affect the color. And then it needs something in the field. We'll paste in that same thing from before. And now, again, you can see the more pink it is, it should be the more spherical it is, in theory. And now let's see what the speed is like. Uh, I guess I'll just carefully hit frame forward. Yeah, not... This might be faster than the morph, but it's definitely a fast. I'm going to hit play, but you're going to see that our frame rate is still really low. But we are morphing from a cube to it, and it is quicker than... We're still using the morph, but we're blending between it instead of using a morph deformer. Um, but yeah, anytime you can use less objects is probably a good thing. But I just knew that if we did this, it would also force us out of... Uh, multi-instance, and I, I think that's still the case. I'm going to try clicking on multi-instance. Um, I'm not seeing much in the way of halfway points, but let's hit play. Oh, maybe... Is that... They do seem to be morphing. Maybe it can... Maybe multi-instance can handle a blend. If it can, I'm kind of impressed. Um, let's increase the amount again carefully. Yeah, that's actually running surprisingly well. I did not think multi-instance would work on this type of blend, but it does seem to be doing all right. Um, all right, this will probably be pretty slow, but actually not terrible. I put back to edge, so we're back to full power, and that is running shockingly well. So we got little cubes, and they inflate into spheres as they go. Neat. Yeah, thanks for the follow-up. That's pretty cool. I didn't, uh, didn't think that would work. I mean, it was the first thing I suggested, but I assumed it would be slower. 
you. Neat. I like it. The, our ability to layer things up in cinema, that's where it really does get crazy. It's pretty cool. And I, I love when they separated the idea of an effector from a field. Like, man, did that add so much power. <laughs> now let's morph into elephants. I mean, you joke about that. I don't even know how... Like, that wouldn't even necessarily be that difficult. It just wouldn't... The resolution wouldn't justify it. But it goes to... Let's just for fun. I'm not going to... You know, we're not going to pursue it, like, really far. But just to show you... As long as you start with your more complicated object... Um, let's just search for... Uh, uh, can't be too many things with Yelly. Where is it? Uh, there he is. I don't know why it's saying he's not downloaded. I've definitely used them before. I used them in the main demo. Um, but you've got your elephant here. If we spherify him, well, first of all, you have to, well, let's just use the body and then spherify. We're going to need the original, so let's keep a copy of that. And then Spearify. What I would do is Spearify this, <laughs> Spearify this the best way we can, which is going to look ridiculous. So we do something like that, poor guy, but it's working. And then, But you're going to see there's all this overlap. And if I wanted to do my best to minimize that overlap, I would probably do a couple layers of smoothing. So if we say smooth after that, you see everything... <laughs> Uh, everything is kind of redeforming. You see everything's kind of melting into this more basic shape. And then I might spherify again. And then let's smooth again. And I'm not even sure if we're going to get anywhere, but I'm going to do this a couple times. And each time I do this, you see how like his ears and everything are getting pointier? The spherify doesn't seem to be helping that much, all things considered. Um, and then we're losing resolution in the center, which isn't what I was expecting. I guess because all these points are sucking the detail over to them. Um, uh, yeah, that, that that used to be an elephant. Um, oh, and then the holes where the eyes are, those are open. So everything turns into a spike, or it does that. But it is not. Oh, I guess he yeah he keeps on twisting. If we if these spherify is moved more towards the center each time, it might be okay. That one's still okay. That's smooth. That one's okay. I wouldn't mind stealing some of the resolutions. I wonder if I can move this over near the head and steal some of that resolution. And then it smooths. And can we do it again? Yeah. <laughs> do something like that. And then smooth it again. Okay, now we get this, this thing. But you see everything's a little more centralized. So then if I spherify again... If we place these kind of properly, that one's not working. Oh, I'm moving the wrong one. Um, yeah, we're getting it. This is a better. This is a better elephant ball by layering it up several times. Um, and then, yeah, I, I, we might be getting diminishing returns now. But you see that, uh, yeah, I was able to make those go into those shapes a little bit more, make them a little bit more spherical. So that's a. This is a better elephant ball. And now that becomes our final shape. So if we grab the original elephant, oh, and this one should probably move kind of in the center. And maybe it's a good idea to put him into a connect. Mm, connect. Don't weld. And then morph the original. points into the shape of this connect. Yes, it's a live link. Um, that's weird. It uh, moved over so much. No matter. Um, put that to animate mode. Yeah, it's moving a little too far left. I'm not sure why. Can I just move this over? No. Oh, look, it's drifting. Is it going to do that every refresh? No. That's strange. Yeah, I'm just going to make that editable. Okay, it didn't like the live connect. 
Okay, so now that that's doing that, I should be able to take this original. Yeah, see that elephant pole over there? But, oh, the axis probably needs to be zeroed out. So let's just do that. Axis, axis. Well, it's just K. Where's the... I thought it was just K. No, no, that's the knife tool. Is it L? Oh, there it is. Okay, I just couldn't find the icon. So I want to reset. Does that even work? No. That's fine, though. Yeah, I should be able to just take all of his points. And then move them. It should work. Refresh. Sort of. Eh, I get oh I guess it is. It still looks like a center right on the head. Anyway, not the greatest of elephant balls. A ball of elephant. But yeah. Anyway, my entire point of that was morphing an elephant into a ball. There's going to be better and worse ways of doing it, and at least this one is not just squishing the entire thing down. There's a little bit more to it than that. But we could probably push it further. Definitely move certain things in certain areas. <laughs> I know it's a weirder one, but... Let's see. <laughs> Let's see. We got about 20 minutes. That's enough time to tackle another question. Uh, is it possible to make a spline using the C node system and control the points with nulls? Um... Maybe. Um, so let's tinker with nodes. There's always a, uh, there's, it's highly likely we'll hit a dead end, but that seems like a simple enough question to attempt to do something with nodes. Um, two things we could do. Let's open up a new file. We can do this with a capsule. I'm going to change it over to my custom node layout, which is exactly like the default node layout, except I've got an asset browser here just to make it easy to search for nodes. Um, what I would like to do is make an asset construction, and it's going to be a mesh primitive group. And if I drag this in, it is now, in theory, generating a brand new object for us. If I double click on it, we've now gone inside of that, and now we can tell it to do something. Now, that something, there's a lot of things it could be, um, eh, let's try making a distribution. Let's do the simplest thing we could. Um, I will make a radial distribution. So kind of think this. Think of this like a matrix object, and it's doing a radial, like a ring. So that should be returning a ring. A ring of what? Well, let's search for the word spline. Oops. Spline, and we got something that is. A spline assembler. So let's we'll see if we can feed that in directly. That is not accepting the distribution directly. How do we make it see it? I know I've done this before. Um, we need to translate that to something. Um, I don't know what. Let's search for the word point. Um, set point, point info, maybe? Maybe. Point positions. Let's see if we can get that as geometry. No. Nope. What can that output as? This might give us the list of valid things. I thought that would just translate. Set. That's a domain. That doesn't like that. Can we get the geometry? And then get the point positions? I think that's a little convoluted. Don't expect that to work. And it did not. Distribution can't go. Oh, that went at the points. And that is a matrix index ratio. What if we feed that as... Oh, ha I found a combination that worked. This is a ridiculous tinkering around. Let's get rid of that. So what do we... I, we might have done uh, several things we didn't need to do. Actually, can we bypass that? 
No. Can we? Nope, there's no additional information. All right, so what are we doing here? I don't know if any of this was a good idea, but we are taking the distribution. It is iterating through this list of like positions. And I'm outputting that as a series of matrices, which is like a position scale rotation. Those position scale rotation are being fed into a point. Presumably, it's only taking the positional information of each one. And then we're outputting that as geometry. And I'm saying, okay, geometry, now you're getting a point info and saying, okay, I'm taking that raw geometry, um, which wasn't really geometry, but it was a list of points that weren't associated with anything. And we're saying, take the point positions and output those into the spline assembler. And that is now returning a spline. The spline assembler, we could say closed. And now you can see that we are actually getting a distribution of um, points all connecting. So we've now made a circle spline that's getting returned. Uh, and we did that via nodes, and this could, you know, this is a raw spline in cinema now. We could put that into an extrude and turn it into geometry if we wanted to. Um, anyway, I, I just wanted to generate a spline. Now, I need to remember, how do we, hmm, I'm trying to remember the way of building this. Uh, we need to make a array of some sort. So let me search for a build. So if I say build, it's a data type. So this is now an array. And that just is like a list of something. It's a list of what? It's a list of, I'll say, ver uh, vectors. So that means a lists of three. So um, let's make this as simple as possible. I'm going to get rid of one of these. And let's see if we can just take this array and put it straight out. So now we're bypassing all of this. If I say this is going from negative 100 to zero to positive 100. Then now, if I zoom up, you see we've got a much simpler setup here. This was a weird translation thing. That's not doing anything. Now I just am saying there's a point at negative 100 and there's a point at zero and a point at 100. And now you can see I'm returning a spline going from there to there to there. So with those all going, I could grab this middle one and push it up on Y. Oh, keep in mind we told this to close. So let me get rid of that. So now you can see it's pushing up on Y. So I was able to make a really easy way of making this arc. Now, the question was, can we control it with nulls? There is, I don't, something I really want is the ability for this to be fed children and for it to acknowledge, it to acknowledge those children. But let's try something else. I want to extract the position of some sort of object. So it doesn't need to be a null, but let's start out with a null. Where do the nulls live these days? Probably, nope. Where did they move nulls? They used to be in there. No. In here? No. Oh, it's got its own thing right there. Just a unfoldered null. That's fine. Just need to know, <laughs> learn. So that's going to be a reference point. Now we need to... What I want to do is we could just drag this in and you see it's going to import this as a cinema classic object and it's now seeing it. And we could output this global matrix. So if we output this global matrix, the matrix is, as I mentioned, the position scale rotation. So then we have to search for the word matrix. And here you can see a bunch of different things. And here's one matrix to vectors. So if I drag this out, oh yeah, that's not the one we want. That's matrix to vectors. Let's try decompose matrix. Okay. You see the matrix to vectors, you'd think that would work, but this is now V1, V2, V3, and offset. That's a like raw mathematical matrix. Decompose matrix is doing extra math internally, saying like, no, 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 it's not going to give us this goofy math that is not helpful at all. It is now going to actually output for us translation, you know, position, scale, and rotation. For some reason, they are calling it translation instead of position, but let's go with that. That wants to be fed a matrix. So I'll say, I want the global matrix of this object import. Now, if I take this translation, which should be the position, and feed it into element one, it looks like it did disappear, and that's at zero. So now if I take that and move it, mm, it doesn't look like it did, but maybe it doesn't refresh. Mm, okay, well, here's a somewhat unfortunate thing. You'll see that when I turn it off and turn it on again, it did acknowledge it and refresh, and it does indeed link to it but it's not refreshing as I drag it. If I turn it off and on, it does update and go to it. If I try moving it after, I don't think it'll change anything. Yeah, that does not. We still have to turn it on and off to force it. So this is, there's a concept in cinema, especially when you're programming, called dependencies. And right now, this mesh primitive group is not acknowledging this null as a dependency because that's cached. 
And in cinema, you don't want, every time it's making a cube, you don't want it to like rebuild a cube from scratch, rebuild a cube from scratch. If the cube isn't changing, it doesn't need to update. So right now it's like, oh, I don't need to update because nothing's changing. And I don't know of a way of saying you're dependent on this null. And even if we make it a child, I don't think that's going to acknowledge it. Now, that was the most basic way to do it, where we just dragged it in manually as an object and fed it in as one of the options. There may be a way of linking to it as a link field, but that is no trivial thing. Now, you see that this is linked as a link field property, and I am not confident in my ability to to make raw parameters. So now that we found something that's a link field, I will say connect node to no, you know, to existing node to the root. So what this should be doing is outputting that to the master thing. And you'll see if I click on our mesh primitive group, there should be an input now and you see that it exists as an input. So we are able to, in theory, drag that null in, you know, and it's now existing and feeding through into this object. So what I'd like to do is by that's now an object coming in. So then can I feed that object in? How do we get the matrix from it? Because that's not a matrix. That is a link field. So how do we get it to see, be seen as an object? Um, that is a fine question. Geometry utility? No, no, no. Objects? Instance? Null. That's interesting. What happens if I drag in a null? See, now there's an op input. Can I just feed that? In? Nope, that doesn't like that either. Um, I'm not sure what this can be fed into. I mean, it's outputting a object as a link field, but what can that turn into? I'm not even sure if this shows only things that are valid for it. Yeah, there's things like decompose container. That's like that, that's container in, and then we might be able to output different information, but like I want to output a matrix, but oh, what does that mean? That's the offset and the, sc I don't even know what this means. Um, doesn't like that. Yeah, it's the, I haven't, you know, you're asking me a, a question. I, I mean, it's something I'm interested in, but I tend to do a lot of research to get the stuff to work and utility object link. Mm, that doesn't seem promising. I mean, yeah, it's outputting an object, but that can't be fed into uh, that. This type of icon implies that's a material based thing. I don't know what the instance is. Reference. No, I don't know what type of ports that that could plug into. It doesn't like any of these. Um, and even the way I made this link field, I can't even be entirely confident that that's correct. If I delete this, I think it might even... No, that's still a link field. Um, so that's something. Um, utility. Material parameterization. Uncategorized. Oh, I think I made that. Um, yeah, I am just not sure of a way of getting this from a link field into the setup we need. Will that translate that? A type of data. And we don't want, oh yeah, that's translating that into data, but that's not what we want. <laughs> hmm. I want to turn that in, I want to get information from that object. I don't know how to do it. Um, let's see, get element, yeah, maybe, but get element is mostly from an array. Yeah, that wants to get information from an array, and that's not an array, it's an object. So we need to, like, turn this into an object that the nodes can acknowledge, because right now it's just a link to an object. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm kind of stumped unless we got somebody from Maxon chiming in. Uh, yeah, I wish I could go further. Um, let's see. Demi is asking, is there any way to delete a certain element from the build node? 
certainly seems like we can only append and truncate from the last entry. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not going to go through a big complicated thing, but you, essentially when it comes to arrays, you have to like explode them out into a big list of arrays and then rebuild a new list based on the valid ones you want to continue. Um, like traveling downstream, not a trivial thing. Um, I mean, I guess once you get used to it, it is used to it, it might be. But and I mean, you know, it, it could just be that I don't have the correct node here, and it would be really easy to get the correct node. But yeah, these are just dealing with arrays. That is not an array. It just goes to like even even I'm getting stumped on like this relatively simple thing. Like I just want to bring an object in and then get information from it, and it's not allowing. I mean, obviously you can just drag it in manually here, but if you wanted that to be like a standalone tool, obviously you'd want, you know, to have it all contained within the object, not having to go inside of that. And it, you know, I'd really like to do is be able to say, hey, take the first object, and that automatically is like this null, and take the second object, and that's automatically the second one, or linking them via these things. That's what I want to be able to do. Um, but uh, I guess actually something I wasn't thinking of. If we mouse over it, where do we get our info? Um, can we get the info of what type this is? Well, it's an object. Yeah, I guess we already know what it is. I thought this had like data that popped up if we moused over it. Maybe it's not because it's not part of the stream yet. Let's just do that. Nope, doesn't even want that. It wants geometry output. Um, I just want some info. Give me the info. Let's see, I'm gonna temporarily do this just to get some info myself. Nope, that's still not. Oh, am I being silly? Nope. One noon. Oh, if I select it. Yeah, okay, I have to select it. So if I click. Okay, yeah. Oh, now you see it is. It does give us this little bit of information. So it's a type of a UUID. And I don't know what that is. And the value it's returning is something crazy. So, yeah, I don't know what a UUID is. If I click on this one, you can see that that is a spline assembly. If I click directly on geometry, it's outputting a geometry object. That's something sensical. But this outputting a UUID, I have no idea what that is. Um, but yeah, um, I would love to continue, but I, we were just at an utter dead end right now. More exploration could definitely solve it. Me asking somebody at Maxon could solve it. Really, it goes to, I just want this all to be way more artist friendly because even the things we just did are not. Like, I can understand being like, okay, if you're going to use nodes, you got to learn the concept of an array. Like that, that makes perfect sense to me. But some of the things we're having to do here are just too many steps. And it's very mathematical. Um, like it's almost like we need a list of like artist-friendly ones. And if you want to go really deep, then there'd be like the mathematical nodes. I know these are separated out into like the raw math here. Um, you could pretty much make any object in cinema just with these nodes if you do them in the right order with this base math stuff. But uh, yeah, sorry, I thought... Uh, I thought we might be able to go further. Um, <laughs> Dean saying that, uh, and you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not in disagreement. That uh, I love capsules, but these nodes are just user hateful, and uh, that's a pretty good way of putting it. And it even goes like it, me, and I know a decent amount of code and the mathematical ways that these things work, and it is not intuitive for me to try and find things, and I'm not sure what the best solution is there. Because even Expresso can be fairly complex when you're doing things like iteration. And this is like almost all iteration. Universally unique identifier. Yeah. Yeah, we could definitely look it up. But like that, yeah, the knowing that isn't helping us right now. Or like even, even getting information. It's like, well, I still don't know what to go. I still don't know where to go with that information. Um, but yeah. As time goes on, as it improves, and even as I learn more about the nodes, I might be able to answer these questions better in the future. But for now, it's sort of trapped. Um, yeah, and uh, DB3D. Um, yeah, there's certain things I could do like right away. Like if, if we were doing certain basic things, we could do it right away. But as soon as you go a little outside that parameter, it's like, oh, and I'm completely lost. I have no idea what to do. Um, 
do 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 and i mean i've made crazy things with nodes i have that entire city generator so it's not like i can't make things but the city generator stayed within the rails of what it, it was capable of and it might simply be that it's not really capable of importing an object the way i did maybe this this just might not have a way maybe it's something obvious and i'm not doing it but that obviousness is not uh not easy like i, I would have thought decomposing the container um would give us what we want yeah, that's the compose container, but that's like data type container in. So that's container in. And then the data type, let's search for UUID. Yeah, see, it's not even auto filling with anything. Um, I mean, it could be a base container. Nope, but even that doesn't give an option. And there are so many different types that this might be. We have to find the right one. Well, there's a UUID. Why didn't I find it? So now I'm saying that the UUID, this is decomposing the container, which means a bunch of data is coming out from there. But now, what information can we get out of that? I don't know. Um, why can't I say I want... No, see, that doesn't even allow... If I drag in the matrix and say, okay, like, ex give me the matrix out of there. That's not, uh, that's not giving us anything. It's not literally giving us nothing. There's nothing to work with there. Dang it. Yeah. Oh, and I'm going to want to, I'm going to want to keep on um, trying to fix it. And I just don't think it's going to be very entertaining. And I don't think I'm going to easily find the solution. Um, but you know what? I do think that puts us pretty much here at the end. So thank you so much, everybody, for coming and hanging out. As mentioned earlier, next week is the season finale. And the, we'll be going on break for like two months or so. So there won't be any primary Rocket Lasso lives for about two months, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. I'm never sure. Um, but next week is the finale and I will be giving away some plugins, but you'll have to be here and live in the chat to uh, have a chance of getting them. So make sure you're here next week. It's going to be a good one. Make sure everybody get, get good questions for next week too. Um, and <laughs> yeah, everybody's always sad when the season goes but you got you gotta you gotta take the break there's a it's a lot of effort and drain and i wish it didn't i wish it i could do the streams and then when i'm done they're just done but there's like the editing like the importing the exporting the editing the uploading the descriptions the tags the thumbnails it's like half a day to get one of these re-uploaded and we're ready for uh general consumption again so it's tricky um yeah, maybe in the future we can try uh, a animated bug. But, yeah, the uh, running on uneven surface is challenging. I mean, they have the character animation tool or the character rigging tool in Cinema. But that can do that type of thing a little bit. But other than that, you'd be building, like, full-on uh, AI. And you're, our questions are always good. They're usually good. It's hard. I'm, I'm very particular about the type of... Well, I try and tackle everything, but... What ends up making for a good question is a very specific type of thing. Um, anyway, I'm just rambling now. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming and hanging out. I will see you next week for the regular stream. I should be doing a bonus stream tomorrow. Uh, uh, if you're on Patreon, I'll be doing a bonus stream tomorrow. Hopefully, well, the plan is to wrap up the gems. I know I've been talking about them for a while, but plugins got launched. And that should be it. So, once again... Thanks, everybody. See you on the Slack channel. If you're not on Slack, go to rocketlasso.com. You can join the Slack. And I'll see you there and online. So bye-bye, everybody.